This is lecture 15 of A2 metric spaces and the first lecture corresponding to chapter 7 of the note. Now chapter 7 is about various different notions of what it means for a metric space to be somehow joined up and there are really two different notions that we'll explore, the notion of connectedness and the notion of path connectedness and we'll also look at the links between those two notions. So in this lecture we'll look at what's called connectedness on a metric space. To define what it means to be connected, we'll first say what it means to not be connected. So we say that a metric space is disconnected. Somehow if you can separate it into two different blobs. So if you can write it as the disjoint union of two non-empty open sets. And we say that a space is connected if you can't do that, so if it's not disconnected. Uh, if you can disconnect it, so if you write it as a disjoint union of two non-empty sets U and V, then we say that those two sets disconnect it. So let's give a little example of a disconnected set. Uh, consider the set X contained in R consisting of the closed interval 0, 1, union the closed interval 2, 3. Now, we remarked earlier in the course that relative to X, the closed interval 0, 1 is actually an open set, even though it's not open in R, and so is the closed interval 2, 3. So I can take those to be my U and V, respectively. Um, they're clearly disjoint, their union is the whole of X, and therefore they disconnect X. It's a bit harder to give an example of a subset of the reals other than a single point that's connected. Later on, we'll show that, in fact, every interval in R is a connected set. And in fact, the converse is true as well. Um, it's often convenient to have a few different ways of formulating the notion of connectedness. And that's what the next lemma is about. So here are three different ways of expressing what it means for a space to be connected. Well, let X be a metric space. Then the following three statements are equivalent. First, that X is connected. Second, that any continuous map from X to the two point space consisting of just two elements, zero and one, is constant. And thirdly, that the only subsets of X, which are both open and closed, are the whole space X and the empty set. So just to clarify, the set zero one here, you can view it in either of two equivalent ways, either as a subset of the reals, or just as a set of two elements with the discrete metric. So they're actually the same metric. So let's prove that those three properties, one, two, and three, are equivalent. So let's first prove that one implies two, so that if you're connected, then any continuous zero, one valued function is constant. So let X be a connected space, and suppose that I have a continuous function from X to the set zero, one. Now the singleton sets consisting of zero and one, respectively, they are both open sets in the space zero, one. And I know that the inverse image of an open set under a continuous map is open. That was an important characterization of continuous maps that we established earlier in the course. So therefore, F inverse of the singleton set zero, which we usually write as F inverse of zero, and F inverse of one, they're both open subsets of X. And they're certainly disjoint because nothing maps under F to both zero and one at the same time. And their union is the whole space X. Therefore, since X is connected, one of them must be empty. And that means that F is constant. I mean, if F inverse of zero is empty, that means that everything maps to one. So F inverse of one must be the whole space. And similarly, if F inverse of one is empty, then F takes the constant value zero. Now let's prove two implies three. So in other words, if every continuous map to zero one is constant, then the only open and closed sets are the whole space and the empty set. So suppose that you have a set A in X that is both open and closed. Well, then its complement is also both open and closed. And in particular, it's open. 
So what that means is that if you define a function f from x to the set 0, 1, by defining it to be 1 on a and 0 on the complement of a, then that's continuous. So why is that continuous? Well, the inverse image of 0 is a complement, which is open. And the inverse image of 1 is a, which is open. And therefore, the image, the inverse image of every open set is, uh, is open. Because the only other open sets are the empty set and, and the whole space 0, 1. Now, so we've got this continuous function from x to 0, 1. But we're assuming that any such function is constant. Now, it could be the constant 1. And in that case, a is the whole of x. Or it could be the constant 0. And that corresponds to a being empty. But we've shown that the only open and closed subsets of A are the whole set and the empty set. Now let's turn to 3 implies 1. So suppose I know that the only open and closed sets are the empty set and the whole set, the whole of X, and I want to conclude that X is connected. So suppose that X is written as the disjoint union of open sets U and V. Well, then the complement of U is equal to V, uh, and that's open. So complement of U is open, which means that U is closed. So U is both open and closed. And if we're assuming that every such set is either X or the empty set, that means so, so U is either X or it's the empty set, and similarly for V. And so there is no way to disconnect x because however I write it as the union of u and v with u and v open and disjoint, one of those two sets must be empty. So that is um, the end of the proof that those three properties are all equivalent. So one being connected, two being that continuous zero one valued functions are constant, and three being that the only open and closed sets are x and the empty set. Next topic I want to look at is the issue of when a subspace of a metric space is connected. And this comes up a couple of times, so it's useful to have a nice portable criterion for this rather than returning to first principles every time. And here is a lemma to that effect. So let X be a metric space and take a subspace Y of X. Then Y is connected as a metric space if and only if the following is true. If U and V are open subsets of X, such that the intersection of U, V and Y is empty, so nothing lies in all three of U, V and Y. And if Y is contained in U union V, then either Y is contained in U or Y is contained in V. So let's look at the proof of this. The key point here is to recall what are the open sets in Y. And remember that we showed earlier in the course that the open sets in Y are exactly the things of the form U intersect Y, where U is an open set in X. So let's take a pair U intersect Y and V intersect Y of open sets. So when do they disconnect Y? Well, for them to disconnect Y, they'd have to be disjoint, which means U intersect V intersect Y is empty. They'd have to cover Y, which is equivalent to Y being contained in U union V. And it would have to be the case that neither is empty. So Y is connected if and only if the first two things written down here imply that, in fact, one of U intersect Y and V intersect Y is empty. So in other words, that there's no disconnection of Y. And it's quite easy to see that that's equivalent, given conditions one and two, to asking that either y is contained in u or that y is contained in v. So this is a convenient little lemma uh, it's characterizing when a subspace y is connected in terms of the open sets in x rather than the open sets just intrinsic to y. Now we're going to look at a few basic properties of the notion of connectedness. First one we'll call the sunflower lemma because the setup it describes, um, well, I'll explain in a second. So we're going to take a collection of 
connected subsets of x, we'll call them a sub little i, where i ranges over some indexing set big I. And suppose that the intersection of all of these is non-empty. So you can think of there being a sort of central point and these are sets all containing that central point looking a bit like a sunflower. Then the claim is that the union of all of those sets is a connected set as well. And this is an example where it's convenient rather than using the initial definition of connectedness in terms of open sets to use another characterization. So we'll show that every continuous zero one value function on this sunflower, the union of the AIs, is constant. So suppose I have such a continuous function f. Now the intersection of all of the AIs is not empty, so pick a point x naught in there, doesn't matter which one. And now I take a, a, an arbitrary point x in the union of the AI. Um, so in particular that x will of course lie in one of the sets AI. But AI is assumed to be connected, and f restricts to be a continuous zero one valued function on AI, and therefore f is constant on AI. And since both x and x0 lie in AI, well we're forced to conclude that f of x equals f of x0. But x is an arbitrary point, so f of everything, f of an arbitrary point is equal to f of x0, which of course means that f is constant. And so that concludes the proof that the union of the AI is connected. So that's the sunflower lemma. The next property that connectedness enjoys is that if you take a set that's connected and form its closure, then that's still connected. So you, perhaps not too surprising, but, um, and the same is true also for any set B that lies between A and the closure of A. So to prove this one, and we're talking here about subspaces of X, and so we'll use that lemma characterizing when a subspace is connected. So let's put ourselves in the situation of that lemma. So suppose B is contained in U union V, where U and V are open in X, and the intersection of the three sets U, V, and B is empty. And U and V are disjoint. Sorry, U and V are not, not disjoint. The intersection of U, V, and B is empty. So what we want to show is that either B is contained in U or B is contained in V. Well, we certainly know that A is contained in U union V because A is contained in B. And we also know that A intersect U intersect V is empty, again, because A is contained in B. And we know that A is connected. So applying that lemma about connected subspaces, we conclude that either A is contained in U or A is contained in V. And without loss of generality, A is contained in U. Now there's no point that's in all three of A, U, and V. And since A is contained in U, well, this forces us to conclude that A is also contained in V complement. So if A wasn't contained in V complement, it would contain a point of V, and that point would be in all three of A, U, and V. So A is contained in V complement. Now V is open, and so V complement is closed, and so it's, it, it's equal to its own closure. So now we're going to take closures of a few things. By assumption, B is contained in the closure of A. Now, A is contained in V complement, so if I take closures of that inclusion, I get that the closure of A is contained in the closure of V complement. But the closure of V complement is just V complement again, because V complement is a closed set. And so what I've deduced is that B is contained in V complement. However, I'm assuming that B is contained in the union of U and V. And if B is also contained in V complement, well, the only conclusion I can draw from this is that B is contained in U. And so I've fulfilled my wish to show that either B is contained in U or B is contained in V. So that concludes the proof. Um, again, the, the key thing here is to use the lemma that I proved earlier, characterizing 
when a subspace is connected in terms of open sets in the metric space X. Uh, the final basic property of connectedness that I want to cover is the continuous image of a connected set. So it turns out that continuous maps preserve connectedness. You can't take a somehow connected joined up set and disconnect it by applying a continuous map. You can't pull, a continuous map won't pull it apart. Let X be a connected metric space and take a continuous map F from X to Y, where Y is some other metric space, then F of X is connected. Looking at the proof, well, we may as well suppose that F is surjective. Um, otherwise, just replace Y with F of X. Um, there's no need to worry about points of Y that are not in the image of F. So we'll suppose that um, F of X is connected. So we just need to show that Y is, so suppose that F is surjective. So we just need to show that Y is a connected space. Suppose that U and V are disjoint open subsets of Y with U union V equal to Y. So we're going to try and disconnect Y. Then their inverse images, F inverse of U and F inverse of V, well, they are disjoint open subsets of X. They're disjoint because um, you can't map under F to something that's in both U and V because U and V are disjoint. And they're open because the inverse image of an open set under a continuous map is open. And their union is all of X. So X is connected, and therefore that means that one of them, say the inverse image of U, is empty. But that then means that U is empty. Um, so if the inverse image of U is empty, that means nothing maps into U. But F is a surjective map, and so if nothing maps into U, that has to that forces us to conclude that there's nothing in U. So U is an empty set. So we've shown that if I've got a partition of U into open sets U and V that are disjoint, uh, one of them's empty, and that's exactly what it means for Y to be connected. Finally, I want to just have a look at the topic of connected components. But let's go back to the sunflower lemma. Maybe I'll just flip back to the statement of the sunflower lemma to remind us. There's the sunflower lemma. So if I've got some connected subsets of a metric space X, whose intersection contains at least one point, then the union of all those subsets is connected. So what that means is that for each little x, in big X, there is a unique maximal connected subset of X, of big X, containing little x. And the reason, so that is the, that set can be constructed as the union of all connected subsets of big X containing X. So that, the point is that that is a connected set by the sunflower lemma, and therefore it must be the maximal connected subset of big X containing little x, because it's the union of all such connected sets. So for every little x, there's a unique maximal connected subset of big X, which contains that point little x. And that has a name. It's called the connected component of big X containing little x. And we'll denote it by capital gamma of little x. So that's the connected component containing little x. And those connected components partition the space, as it turns out. And moreover, space is connected precisely if it has just one connected component. Well, let's prove this fact. So suppose I have two different connected components, gamma of x and gamma of y. And suppose that they're not disjoint. And suppose there's a, an element a in the intersection of gamma x and gamma y. Well, then we wish to show that they're actually the same set. So this is what it means for these sets to partition the space. Either they're disjoint or the same. Well, if I apply the sunflower lemma again, um, well, the union of these two sets, gamma of x and gamma of y, is connected because they're individually connected. Gamma of x is connected. Gamma of y is connected. 
and they meet in the point A. Um, so I've got a connected set, gamma x union gamma y, which contains x. But by the definition of connected component, gamma of x is the union of all connected sets that contain x. And therefore, gamma of x must contain gamma of x union gamma y. And the only way that can happen is if gamma of y is contained in gamma of x. Similarly, gamma of x is contained in gamma of y, and therefore gamma of x equals gamma of y. So if I've got two connected components that are not disjoint, then in fact they coincide. Therefore, they partition um, the space. Well, a space is connected. Um, well, the second statement is kind of obvious. Once you know, yeah, I mean, a space is connected if and only if the maximal connected space containing every point is the whole space. So that's um, if and only if the whole space is connected. Okay, so that is a discussion of the notion of connectedness. We'll turn in the next lecture to the somewhat different notion of path connectedness, and then we'll talk a bit about how those two concepts are related to one another. This is lecture 16 of A2 metric spaces, and this is pretty much an entirely non-examinable lecture. In the last lecture, we talked about the notion of connectedness for a metric space. But we were only really able to give examples of spaces that weren't connected, and that's obviously somewhat unsatisfactory. So in this lecture, I want to describe the connected subsets of the real line. So let me give a definition. Let's take a subset E of the real line. Then we say that E has the interval property if the following is true. So whenever I have two points in E, x and y, with let's say x strictly less than y, then the whole of the closed interval between x and y is contained in E. So we're going to prove the following two statements. So we'll first prove that a subset of the real line is connected if and only if it has the interval property. And then second, we'll prove that a subset of the real line has this interval property if and only if it really is an interval. And so if you put those two things together, you get a theorem that the connected subsets of the real line are precisely the intervals. Now, let me be clear about what the word interval means in this context. An interval can be infinite, either on the left or the right, or on both sides. And on either side, it could be either closed or open. So, for example, the interval 0, 1 that's open on the left and closed on the right, that's an interval. The set of real numbers strictly greater than 2 is an interval. The set of real numbers greater than or equal to 2 is an interval. So all of those are intervals. So that's a complete classification of the connected subsets of the real line. OK, so we're going to prove these two statements. We'll prove the number one first, that a subset of the real line is connected if and only if it has this interval property. So that's the statement that if I've got two points in E, then the whole of the closed interval between them is also in E. And then secondly, I'll show that that property is equivalent to actually being an interval. So let's turn to the proof of this first statement. So there are two things to show there, an only if direction and an if direction. We'll do the only if first. So suppose that E is a connected subset of the real line and that I've got two points X and Y in E. So I want to show that E has the interval property. So I want to show that the whole of the closed interval between X and Y also lies in E. Well, if X equals Y, that's obvious. So suppose X is not equal to Y, and then without loss of generality, let's suppose X is strictly less than Y. And suppose that it's not the case that the whole interval closed X, Y lies in E. Well, if that is not the case, then there's a point C, strictly between X and Y, that doesn't lie in E. But if we have such a point C, then we can disconnect E in the following way. So we'll take open sets U and V as follows. So U is the set of real numbers strictly less than C. So the infinite um, open interval minus infinity up to C. 
and v is the set of real numbers strictly bigger than c, so open c up to infinity. So it's obvious that those two sets u and v don't intersect. E is contained in u union and v. That's just because u union v is the whole real line except for the point c, but by assumption c doesn't lie in E. But we don't have E being contained in U, and that's because Y is in E, but it's not in U. And E is not contained in V, and that's because X is in E, but not in V. And if you recall from the last lecture, the criterion for a subspace being disconnected, well, what we've produced here is exactly a disconnection of the subspace E of the reals. So E is not connected if it fails to have the interval property. So now let's turn to the other direction. So suppose that E does have the interval property, and then we need to conclude that E is a connected set. So suppose it's not connected, well then it may be disconnected. So E is contained in the union of two sets U and V, where U and V are open subsets of R. Uh, the intersection of U, V and E is empty, um, but we don't have E contained in U or E contained in V. So once again, this is what it means for E to be not connected. So the intersection of E with U and E with V are both non-empty because otherwise we would have either E contained in U or E contained in V. And so let's take a point in each of those two intersections. So suppose x lies in E intersect U and y lies in E intersect V. Now the intersection of all three sets E, U and V is empty. Therefore we can't have x equals y, so x is not equal to y. And we may as well assume that x is strictly less than y without loss of generality. So now we use the fact that E has the interval property and that tells us that the whole of the closed interval between x and y is contained in E. So some of those points will lie in U and some of them will lie in V. And we'll define S to be the set of all z between x and y, so all z in closed x, y, for which z lies in U. So it's a non-empty set because x lies in it. It's, it's bounded because it's contained in the closed interval from x to y, and therefore it has a supremum, which I'll call c. And whatever that c is, that also lies in the closed interval from x up to y. So the, the closed interval from x up to y is contained in E, and by assumption E is contained in the union of U and V, and so this supremum c must lie in either U or V. And we'll look at those two cases separately, and we'll get a contradiction from either case. So suppose first that c lies in u. Well then definitely c is not equal to y, because y lies in v. And since u is an open set, what that means is that there has to be an open interval. Um, I've just made it half open on the right. So an interval, closed interval from c up to c plus epsilon, uh, that's contained in u and is also contained in closed x up to y. So for that second statement, I've used the fact that c is not equal to y. So that's just using the fact that u is an open set. But this then means that the interval from c up to c plus epsilon, closed on the left and open on the right, that's contained in, in s. And that contradicts the fact that c is an upper bound for s. Uh, for instance, the number c plus epsilon over 2 lies in s, and it's strictly bigger than c. So that's a contradiction. Now, suppose on the other hand that c lies in v. Well, then c is not equal to x, because x lies in u. And because v is an open set, I can find some half open interval c minus epsilon up to c, so open on the left, closed on the right, uh, that's contained in v and is also contained in closed x up to y. So for that last statement, I've used the fact that c is strictly bigger than x. Well, in particular, that means that the closed interval from c minus epsilon over 2 up to c is 
disjoint from S because it's contained in V. And that contradicts the fact that C is the least upper bound for S. So C minus epsilon over 2 would be a smaller upper bound for S. Um, so C couldn't have been the least upper bound for S. So in either case, I've got a contradiction here. And therefore, we were wrong to assume that neither E is contained in U or E is contained in V. So actually, one of those two things does happen. Either U, E is contained in U or E is contained in V, and therefore E is connected. So that was a little bit long, but let's just recall what we've achieved here. So we've shown that a set E is connected, a set E of real numbers is connected, if and only if it has this interval property. And that was what I called statement one earlier. Now, to complete the classification of connected subsets of the reals, I need to prove what I call statement two. And that's the statement that a subset of the reals has the interval property if and only if it is itself an interval. OK, so we'll have a look at the proof of that. And to prove that, it's convenient uh, to avoid dividing into lots of cases to introduce a little abusive notation. Uh, so if E is a subset of the reals, we'll allow ourselves to talk about the infimum of E, even if E is not bounded from below. Um, so we'll let it take the value minus infinity. And similarly for supremum. So if E is a set that's not bounded from above, we'll define its supremum to be infinity. So that's a, a bit of an abusive notation. Normally, one would only really talk about inf and sup for bounded sets. And another little abusive notation that's convenient as a shorthand is that we'll allow ourselves to write the closed interval from minus infinity up to A. Well, we don't, that doesn't really make sense. I mean, that's just what we mean when we write that is actually the half open interval, the half line from minus infinity up to A. Similarly, I'll write, for example, closed zero up to infinity when what I mean is zero up to infinity open on the right. So the set of numbers greater than or equal to zero. So we'll see in a second why I want to introduce these abuses of notation. But suppose that E has the interval property and write C for the infimum of E, little c for the infimum of E, and big C for the supremum of E. So because I'm allowing myself this abuse of notation, that little c and big C are always defined even if E is not bounded. So I claim the following two inclusions. So I claim that the open interval from little c to big C is contained in E, and that E is contained in the closed interval from little c to big C. Now here, when making this formulation, I'm allowing myself little c could be minus infinity, big C could be plus infinity. So this is why I'm allowing myself to talk about, for example, the closed interval from zero up to infinity. So maybe let's just think about what this would mean when little c is zero and big C is plus infinity. This claim is then the statement that open zero up to infinity. So in other words, the real numbers strictly bigger than zero are contained in E and that E is contained in closed zero up to infinity, which by convention is the real numbers greater than or equal to zero. So that's what this statement then means. So I claim that inclusion, and that's easily seen to imply that E is an interval. Um, I mean, when you see that inclusion, there are basically four different cases, which might not actually be distinct cases if little c is minus infinity and or big C is plus infinity. So for example, if little c is zero and big C is one, well, this inclusion then tells me that open zero one is contained in E, and that E is contained in closed zero one. And there are precisely four possible sets E that have that property. So open zero one, zero one that's open on the left and closed on the right, zero one that's closed on the left and open on the right, and closed zero one. So you can convince yourself that if I have a set E that's sandwiched between an open interval and a closed interval in this way, then it really is an interval in the usual sense. So it remains to prove that claim. Now, 
the right hand occlusion, the fact that E is contained in closed little c up to big C, is just completely immediate from the definition of infant sup. And so the heart of the matter is to show the left hand inclusion that open little c up to big C is contained in E. So let's do that now. So suppose I have a point Z in open little c up to big C. I want to show that Z lies in E. Well, there has to be a point X in E, which lies is greater than or equal to C and strictly less than Z. Because if not, uh, Z would also be a lower bound for E and it would be bigger than little c. But I'm assuming that C is the inf of E. And similarly, there's a Y in E, Y less than or equal to capital C, uh, and Z strictly less than Y, because otherwise Y would be an upper bound for E that's smaller than big C. So those points X and Y lie in E, and therefore by the interval property, the whole of the closed interval between X and Y lies in E. Uh, but Z lies in that closed interval between X and Y, and therefore Z lies in E. So Z was an arbitrary point in open little c up to big C, and I've shown that it lies in E, therefore the whole of that open interval little c up to big C is contained in E which is what I claimed. So that concludes the proof. Um, just to finish, let me explain why the intermediate value theorem is an application of what we've just shown and the material of the last lecture. Suppose I have a continuous function from closed AB to the reals. Well, I've just shown that closed AB is a connected set. And in the last lecture, I showed that the notion of connected is preserved under continuous maps. So f of closed AB is connected. Um, and by what I've shown, that this latter set, so the image of closed AB under f, is a connected subset of the reals, and therefore it's an interval. And in particular, it contains every point C between f of A and f of B. So it has the interval property, contains every point C between f of A and f of B. OK, so as I said, this lecture is non-examinable. Um, but as soon as, once you've defined the notion of connected set, you really have to ask yourself, what are the connected subsets of the reals? Uh, it's a very basic question. So we've answered that question. And that now gives us a, a lot of examples of connected sets. Um, and then finally, we observe right at the end that you can think of the intermediate value theorem um, using this language. So that's the end of this lecture. In the next lecture, we'll talk about the notion of path connected.